Matthew 25, 31 to 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to, to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they say, then they say themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then we will answer them, then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In case you haven't noticed, we've got some holes in the crowd today. <laughs> Get a ball bat. That wouldn't work, would it? We have a, a quick new development. <laughs> the church is now branched into Knoxon, Montana. And uh, the ones that you see missing this morning are going to be meeting at 3 o'clock Montana time. Uh, and I'm going to be preaching for them over there. So it's a, it's a new change. It's, we needed to do that for the souls that have just been brought to the Lord that won't be able to come here every Sunday. So... It's going to be difficult for a while, but pray for us, and uh, it's necessary, something that we need to do. I'm going to be talking to you this morning about judgment, and I'm going to have to divide it into two lessons because I don't have time to do what I plan to do this morning, so we'll, we'll just uh, divide it. And this judgment that we're talking about is the judgment that uh, everybody seems to be aware of when you, when you talk about Christianity. When you talk about the things that God has planned for his people, the great plan of salvation, what Paul refers to as the mystery of the gospel, I want to talk about that, but I want to mention some things. During our class and, and during Ron's discussion about the Lord's Supper, 
he brought up how everything that we seem to talk about has uh, connections, like we have uh, telepathy. Well, I, I, I do believe we do. <laughs> there, there's more to this than us just happening on to the same thoughts. We are studying from the same pattern. That's one thing. But we also have help in that we're guided, not miraculously, but somehow we're guided in the thoughts that we have. We're, we're helped and we're... If we don't believe that, why do we pray such things as... Uh, one of the old brothers that um, didn't quite know what he was saying, he says, give the preacher a ready recollection of what he's about to say. Uh, <laughs> he, he didn't understand the word that he was using. Give him a ready recollection, which is, that's the brotherhood speak for uh, help, him, help him say what he needs to say. Help him say what he's studied. Help him to remember we, need, we believe in that help, and I, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't, but the how of that is as broad as, uh, <laughs> and we won't get into that. But Russ said something about committing ourselves into God's hand. That's exactly what all of what I've been trying to say for the last month and a half or two months is about putting ourselves to use in God's hands, being an instrument of righteousness, not of unrighteousness, learning what it is that's pleasing to the Lord. And uh, Bubba brought up, how, how do we feel good about ourselves? How do we love ourselves? When God said what he did to Cain, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Won't you feel good about yourself? if you're doing the right thing, if you're trying to do the right thing. And somebody else brought up uh, the idea about competition. Uh, I, it was you, Ron, said something. When someone comes up, uh, actually, folks, I have been asked, do I feel threatened by Marty? <laughs> no, I don't feel threatened by Marty. I feel supported by Marty, because Marty is doing the work of the Lord. We might disagree on some things. I know we do, but I have, <laughs> I made the statement one time. I said, don't trust me. You check what, Marty piped up. He says, I do. <laughs> so and that's fine, because I don't want anybody basing their eternal destiny on how I interpret the word of God. That's, that's not my job. That's your job. I'm doing it for me, and I'm doing the best that I can for you, but it's your job to do what the, uh, the people in Berea did, and that is to search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. Amen. Competition, no. Supporting each other, that's what it is. We're going to talk about that more in a little bit. I had several ideas of words that we use that, that fit what we're talking about when it comes to judgment. These are not Bible words. These are English words that fit Bible principles, and I want you to share them with me this morning. We're not going to get through all of them. But I want to talk about value. If you read all of the parables of the Lord... You have to, well, no, I can't say that. You don't have to. But you should come away with an understanding that God values certain characteristics in people. And God is hoping to use those characteristics for His purposes in this world. Value, the definition, is the regard... Uh, something is held to deserve. There is a deserving of value or it's not valuable. The importance or worth or usefulness of something. Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about this usefulness a little bit later on. In 2 Peter chapter 1, after this 
grand list of what Marshall, old Marshall Keeble used to call the stairway to heaven. It's the growth process of a Christian. It starts out with faith. To this faith supply moral excellence and moral excellence knowledge and knowledge self-control and to your self-control perseverance and to your perseverance godliness and to your godliness brotherly kindness and in Christian love. What a list. Here's what Peter says about that. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They render you, these, these things make you not useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of Jesus our Lord. I want to take a look at a passage found in Daniel. Because judgment, you use this also. Somebody did this morning. The balance. The concept of weighing things out. In Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 25, we have the story of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. What an arrogant, unbelievably shallow individual to be the king or the co-regent of the most powerful nation on earth at the time. About to not be, but he sure didn't have much going for him. There wasn't much of any of those characteristics that Peter talked about because this man was pretty much useless in the position that he was in. Now this is the inscription which was written out. Here's the background of this story. Belshazzar, one of the, the last of the Babylonian monarchs, had a party. And in order to do this party, he brought out the vessels of gold that had been uh, taken to Babylon because of the silliness of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, long time before, had wanted to impress the Babylonians and God had just given him a, a reprieve in life and so he was wanting to show off and he brings these people from Babylon in and he shows them everything in his storehouse, all of the gold of the, of the temple. He showed them everything. And Isaiah came to him and said, who are these guys? He told him, he says, what'd you show them? <laughs> Isaiah knew what was going on, but he says, what'd you, what'd you show them? I showed them everything. You showed them everything? I showed them every last thing that we have. And then Isaiah says, okay, they're going to come get it later on. You know what his response was? And this is one of the best kings they ever had. His response was, they're not going to do it to me. <laughs> they're going to do it later. I'm going to be okay. That's a... Well, here, here the, the chickens are coming home to roost because the stuff that was taken is now being used by this pagan king and, and he doesn't care about anything except the party that he's having. So, it says, this is the inscription. What happened was, while they were having this party, the big hand came and it started writing an inscription on the wall. And Nebuchadnezzar sees it. I mean, uh, Belshazzar sees it. And he realizes this, this, this is not really good. And he starts calling for people to come and answer what it means. And finally Daniel's brought out. And Daniel says, now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, tekel, upharsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been, here, here's, the, here's the judgment. 
You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient or wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. It's amazing. That night, that very night, his kingdom came to an end and he was killed. Hmm. Weighed in the balances and found wanting, found deficient. We read about this king and it happening to him, but do you realize that that weighing in the balances is going to be for every last one of us? Salvation has nothing to do with that. Salvation is an accomplished fact for those of us who have been born again, for those of us who have come back to God, however that was done, whether it was in the Old Testament or whether it is in the New Testament, and we followed the law of Christ, if we have come back to God and have been given a new start, that's where we begin. But this, this weighed in the balances is what happens after all of that. Now I want to talk about contribution. Contribution, the part played by a person or thing in bringing about a result or causing something to advance. We have a basket in the back that we contribute to. That is our contribution of cash, money, to the church. But it is not our contribution because what we say what we do how we live how we function how we put the Lord first how we put ourselves in the hands of God all of those things is part of our contribution to the cause to advance it in Mark chapter 12 the Lord Jesus told a story about contribution. He sat down opposite the treasury. I don't know whether you know where I first had the inclination to put a basket in the back. We did this in Florida and then we, we brought that idea here and I, it wasn't just me, others had already had the idea. But it's there, and people came and put their contributions into that collection place. I understand that there were 13 places in the women's court where collections were taken, that people could come and put their money into whatever receptacle there was. Well, Jesus had chosen one and was sitting and watching. It says, he began observing how people were putting money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to about a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of the contributors to the treasury. Well, you might ask why. It didn't amount to anything close to the same amount. Jesus' answer was for they put in out of their surplus. You remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? How Lazarus was wanting just the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But she, in her poverty put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. That's what she did. Do you remember Abraham Lincoln's address at Gettysburg? Not that old. <laughs> Russ, now I, I, I've, been, I, I've been really proud of what you said. Now watch out. <laughs> We have all read, let me put it that way, 
Abraham's address at Gettysburg and how he described the people that had died there. He said, we can't do anything to hallow this ground. We can't do anything to, to magnify anything here. But what we can do is honor those who have done this. She gave her last full measure of devotion. What Abraham Lincoln was talking about was they died here. But this woman was willing to give what she had, the only thing she had to continue living with. She was willing to offer her last for this cause. In 2 Samuel, we learn something from David about what it means to satisfy God with sacrifice. What is the word, what comes to your mind when the word is sacrifice is used? Well, Marty was talking this morning about offering children on a, on a, a bronze altar. That was a, I, I honestly question whether that was even a sacrifice for those parents because they obviously didn't cherish the children. Well, you wouldn't do that. You'd die first rather than offer your children as a burnt offering. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, David was in trouble. Actually, Israel was in trouble. And it caused David to do something stupid. David went out and had uh, Joab go out and number all of the people so he could know how powerful his army was. Even Joab, who was not really a godly man, he was a great general, but he wasn't a godly man, and he had, he loved to kill people. Even Joab said, King, you don't want to do this. This is not the right thing to do. We need to trust in God. I don't think he said that, but I think that was the intent. David did it anyway, and a plague came upon the people. David watched his people die. 72,000 in one day died. So Gad came, the, the prophet Gad, came to David that day and he said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord at the, on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. You remember the Jebusites? They were the people that held Jerusalem until David. David conquered them and took the city of Jerusalem for, to be the mountain of the house of the Lord. David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. And Arana looked down and he saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And he bowed his face to the ground before the king. Then Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. Arana, good man it seems like, said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen and the burnt offering for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for wood. Everything you need is right here, king. Everything, O king, Arana gives to the king. What's wrong with that picture? Is there anything wrong with that? Should he do it? Should David take this? Because, I mean, he said go up and offer a sacrifice, right? Why would this not be right? Why would David think this is not right? There's an attitude on the part of David that he understands what the word sacrifice means. The king said to Arana, No, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Why? 
David said, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. The Lord offering his sacrifice came at extremely high cost. Our salvation has come at extremely high cost, not just the life of the Lord Jesus, but the life of all of the faithful who have gone before us, who have given their last full measure of devotion for this cause. David understood that whatever he did for the Lord right here, whatever he did to the Lord to stave off this plague would have to come at sacrifice. So David bought it. David bought what it was. I, I don't know how much an ox or a, a yoke of oxen was going for at the time. I don't know how much the threshing floor was. I don't, know, I don't know any of those things. But I do know this, that what David did here was a sacrifice beyond what would have been required. David built the altar and offered the burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land. And the plague was held back from Israel. <sighs> How does that fit us? I'll go to another word here. The word synergy. You know, <laughs> I, love, I love words. Look to see when this word first appeared in English. Sometime in the 18th century. 17th or 18th century. Synergy. What in the world does that mean? It means the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. What in the world has that got to do with Christianity? <laughs> you can't see any similarity there? Can't see any really important principles of Christianity in that? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Begin reading in verse 4. I'm out of time. I want to read this and then we'll quit for today. Now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit you're talking about earlier. How do we have these common thoughts when we're going in so many different directions? Because there's one spirit that guides us. And there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. The same force is behind all of this. We are connected, folks. We are connected there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Same God controlling the end result of what happens here. But to each one, each one of us, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, Realize that this is not talking about us right here, right now, today, the way Paul wrote it here. Because this is talking about something miraculous, something that was given for them to get and to understand and to hold on to the completed word of God eventually here. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, Miraculous wisdom. Man, would I love to have a dose of that. Miraculous wisdom. To know how to handle each situation that comes up. To not do something stupid that I <laughs> I get so aggravated with myself. That's why sometimes it's really hard 
to have your countenance lifted up because we do dumb stuff. We just do. To another, the word of knowledge, miraculous knowledge. It would be so easy if we just had it and didn't have to study, study, study to get it. To another, faith by the same spirit. That one, I, I really, somebody's going to have to explain that one to me because I'm not sure how that worked. And to another, gifts of healing. I, don't, I understand that one. Lay your hands on somebody and it goes away. It'd be nice. Russ, I'd love to be able to lay hands on you and just take that away. And anybody else that has physical problems that we could just get rid of by laying on of hands. And to another, the effecting of miracles of all kinds. And to another prophecy, another distinguishing of spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one, each person that was given this. It was given to each one individually, just as he wills. That was then. This is now. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Hmm. All of that for the common good. That's the synergy. We all come together and we work together for the common good. That's love, folks. That's exactly what Marty was trying to... <laughs> you did more than try, but you did a good job this morning. That's, that's exactly what we need to learn from this is that it is our own contribution of what we know is good for each other that causes this growth that he talks about. But I want to talk about, I can't, it's, we're past time. I want to talk about reciprocity next week. I love that word. First time I ever ran across that word was in a movie. <laughs> Tom Clancy <laughs> had a movie and the, the, the movie was clear and present danger. Reciprocity was, they did this to us, we're going to do this to them. That's, that's reciprocity. Reciprocal engines are engines that force each other back and forth. That's what pistons and crankshafts do. Reciprocity. We'll talk about reciprocity next week. All of this is leaning toward the judgment that God has for us as individuals and how we fit into this plan of God. What we contribute to it, what value we have to his kingdom has nothing to do with salvation. Well, I, I can't say that. It does have something to do with salvation, perhaps. But salvation is something we already have before this even begins, right here. If you haven't, if you have been born again, if you have been given that new start, and that new start is where all of this work begins. The lesson is yours, folks. I hope we can get to the, the sum of all of this pretty soon. I'm anxious to. If you're not right with God, if your countenance is not lifted up, do well. Do what you know you need to do to make your life right before God. Won't you come while we stand and sing? There's a fountain free for you and me.